How's that a movie looks like a movie and a video looks like a video? How do they create images that feel real and immersive? Well, let's find out and see if we can apply some of those concepts in our own filmmaking. Okay, so let's start from lighting. Shaping light is one of the most important aspects in the photography of a movie. No light, no picture. No picture, no movie. But lighting is not only used to give the camera sensor enough light to capture an image. Lighting is much more than that. Good lighting makes the image, and in particular skin tones, pleasing to the eye. It allows the viewer to understand at which time of the day the story is taking place, and it conveys emotions through the use of contrast and color. The direction where the light is coming from plays a huge role in making an image cinematic. A very effective way to make an image feel cinematic is to use backlighting, meaning that we place our subject between a light source and the camera. This is a uh, technique widely used in movies, and uh, it can range from very subtle all the way to a full-on silhouette effect. This concept of backlighting applies to various degrees roughly to 90% of the shots you see in a movie. And this holds true for close-ups as well, where you would see the camera being placed on the shadow side of the face of the actor. And the degree of how much your backlighting and how dark the shadow side is can vary based on the mood of the story. The reason why backlighting is widely used is because it allows to give depth and three-dimensionality to what's actually a 2D image giving the viewer the feeling of looking at real world instead of just a screen. Let's take a look at a simple example that I shot in my kitchen. Here we have the camera placed on the shadow side of the face of the subject, so we are slightly backlighting her, with a combination of a hard source replicating the sun and a soft source replicating the sky. We can see that if we place the camera on the opposite side, front lighting her, we lose all the alternating patterns of light and shadow that give depth and three-dimensionality to the image. Another thing to keep in mind is the quality of light. A light source can be either soft or hard and everything in between basically. The bigger the source compared to the subject, the softer it's going to be. And inversely, the smaller, the harder. Normally soft sources are very pleasing on skin tones as they wrap around facial features nicely and don't cast any hard shadows. And they are in fact widely used on close-ups. Let's take a look at three different qualities of light on a medium shot, going from a very hard source with a uh, cob LED pointed directly at the subject, to something that falls in between, like a tube light, and lastly, a very soft one using the same cob LED, but this time through a layer of diffusion, and uh, let's take a look at how they compare to each other. Obviously there are no definitive rules and not everything should be shot with a soft source. You should always focus on what suits the story better, but if you have no story and you just want to make somebody look good, go for soft. Let's have a glimpse at some soft lighting from a Hollywood movie. Let's take a look at a uh, sequence from Knives Out shot by Steve Yetlin to see how they lit it. We have a wide shot with a light coming from the window and then they cut to a close-up and you would think that they kept the lighting the same, right? But the lighting that's lighting her on the close-up is not coming from the window anymore, as you can see from the behind the scenes. They brought in a soft source close to her, wrapping the light around her face nicely and motivated it with the window that we saw in the white shot before. Super simple and yet super effective. Also, this brings me to the next point, which is motivation. Motivated lighting is a technique used to replicate or accentuate existing lighting sources and it allows the viewer to believe that the world they're seeing on the screen is actually real. In the Knives Out example, they motivated the soft light in the close-up by establishing the direction and quality of light by showing the window in the wide shot so that when they cut to the close-up, the viewer knows where the light is coming from. Another basic technique to motivate light employs using a practical, which is a light source visible in the frame and that we are familiar with in the real world, for example, a uh, table lamp. But the table lamp itself doesn't give us enough output for filmmaking, so we augment it with an out-of-frame source that has been motivated by the table lamp. So here's a practical example. A practical example. It seems that what's lighting the subject is the table lamp next to her. In reality, I'm using a softbox placed right outside the frame, and uh, if we turn it off, this is what the table lamp is actually doing by itself. Quite a difference. 
but still we believe that what we see looks real because the light coming from the softbox is motivated by the lamp. Right on track, let's talk about composition. Composition can be thought of as the decision-making process of the positioning in the frame of what we want the viewer's eyes to see. Composition is a crucial element when telling a story through images, and it's 100% intertwined with production design that also plays a huge role in the making of an image, just as much if not more than the right camera placement. But anyways, there are different techniques we can study and analyze to better understand how to present our images to the viewer. We can observe the rule of thirds, which is widely used in movies. We can use leading lines to guide the observer's eye. We can show empty space to portray the feeling of a character, a frame within the frame, but apart from learning these rules, we gotta understand how the camera placement and the framing make us feel. What I like to focus on when thinking of composition is having layers within the frame to create depth, so that you have a, a foreground, a middle ground, and a background. And sometimes I also think of those three layers as having three different brightness values, starting from the foreground, which is going to be the darkest part of the frame, then the middle ground, where I would usually place the subject, which uh, would be a proper exposure, and then the background, where I might have a, a practical, um, which would be the brightness object in frame. Sometimes you don't have the chance of creating three different layers and you just manage to have a foreground and middle ground and background are together, but that's fine as long as you think about creating depth with what you have. Here is a uh, shot of me uh, in the basement, framed uh, in three different ways. And I would say that neither of those is right or wrong, they're just different. And most of the times you're not going to think about rules when framing a shot, you're going to think about story and what feels right in the moment. Basically the right framing and composition is there, you just gotta find it. Also be aware of the fact that not every shot calls for an interesting composition. Sometimes a frame that has too much visual interest can be distracting and not serving the purpose of the story. This is what Roger Deakins once said in the Team Deakins podcast when working with the Cohn brothers on Fargo. You know, one time they said to me, that frame's too interesting. And I got what they meant, it was on Fargo. You know, I wanted to keep a bit of a chair in shot or something to give the frame a bit of I don't know, a bit of close it in a bit. And they, they said, no, no, that's too interesting. And I, I got what they were saying. Yeah. Last but not least, we've got color pipeline. An essential step when enhancing what's been done during production is the manipulation and finessing of the color, contrast and texture of an image. Often we refer to this type of manipulation as color grading, but that's not totally correct. Color grading doesn't define the look of a movie. There's a um, step prior to that, which is often forgotten, which is called look development. Usually the DOP and the director would have a discussion with a colorist or color scientist on the overall look of the movie. From there, a look would be developed, most of the times in the shape of a LUT, which is called show LUT. The whole movie would run through it, and uh, this defines the color and tonal rendition of every single shot. On the other hand, color grading is the finessing and shaping of the images after they ran through the show light. To make you better understand the difference between look development and color grading, let's take this image. This is what's called a log image, and this is how a cinema camera would capture a scene. Think of it as a uh, uninterpreted data. Then we apply a show light, which transforms what the camera saw into the intended look. And on top of that, we add color grading to further finesse the image. Nowadays, color grading is such a hot topic on YouTube and so much can be done to an image in post-production, which is great, but at the same time a little dangerous, because we run the risk of thinking that the colors that we see on the screen are dictated by the color grading process, while in reality they are imparted for the most part by the production custom design departments together with the cinematographer's decisions on lighting. Okay, that's all for today. If you liked this video, please let me know by leaving a thumbs up, by commenting, subscribing, and um, I'll see you next time.